I will now begin. <laughs> uh, welcome everybody. This is, I think, our fifth Nature Chain talk. Um, and our guest speaker this evening, I'm very pleased to say, is Matt Pryor, or Mr. Tree Sparrow, I gather. <laughs> um, Matt is chairman of the Wiltshire Ornithological Society, have I said that correctly? <laughs> and a licensed bird ringer for over 20 years, studying and conserving birds across Wiltshire. He has run the Wiltshire Tree Sparrow Recovery Project since 1999 and maintains 1,200 nest boxes for them. Matt also volunteers for the Marlborough Downs Space for Nature project, advising and working with farmers and landowners to improve habitats for wildlife. His conservation work on the Marlborough Downs centres on the tree sparrow, which is on the red list of endangered birds and was almost extinct in North Wiltshire when he began taking interest in him, in them. We're very lucky to have his time this evening since he's busy preparing for a trip to Africa this month for further ringing bird, ringing of birds there. But his talk this evening has been put together specially for us and is centered on the birds we may find in our own gardens. So Matt's going to speak hopefully about 45, 50 minutes and then there'll be time for questions as usual afterwards, at which point please unmute yourselves. Okay, so over to you, Matt. Welcome. Okay, so you can see the, uh, the whole of the screen, can you? Of my yes. presentation. Yeah, excellent. Okay, great stuff. Lovely. Okay, well, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, as as I've been introduced, yeah, yeah, Mr. Tree Sparrow is is a is a phrase that's been uh, been apportioned to me. Um, I'm doing this talk in particular because the timing is that uh, in in two weeks' time. It's the RSPB's Big Garden Bird Watch, a, a great event to be able to count the birds in your garden and record what you have. And, and hopefully th this will inspire you to go ahead and participate in that uh, survey, but also to give you a bit more of an idea about the birds that are used in your garden. Um, the very first thing I always say to people, I'm going to assume that you don't know an awful lot about birds. And what I'll say is, is... When people say to me, it's a bit bigger than a robin and a bit smaller than a blackbird or things like this, I always say to people, look at the bill. If you look at the bill of a bird, if it's a fat bill, it's going to eat seeds. It's a finch or a bunting. If it's a thin bill, if it's a very, very thin bill, it might be taking insects. If it's a bit halfway house, it's a generalist and it will eat many things. So that can often give you the idea about which species of bird you are seeing. That's the number one hint. Okay, so here we have the, the blue tip. Very, very common bird. Everyone knows a, a blue tip. There are three and a half million pairs in the UK, um, and they were number two on the uh, big garden bird watch list of 2021. So, yes. second most recorded in gardens, this is the bird where most people would think is probably the most common bird in the UK, but it's not. It's not the most common bird in the UK. There are about three and a half million pairs of blue tip in the UK. So, they love to use gardens and, and rural and sort of suburbia. So, so, we're in their prime areas. And this index here, this is an indication, this is pulled together by the British Trust for Ornithology. This survey um, is, is a, or this data is, is a complex of about two or three different strands of, of bird surveying across the whole of the country. So this shows that from 1994 to 2019, that the, the blue tip population goes slightly up, slightly down, but it's generally a very, very stable population of birds. And, and that is in the main because blue tits are a generalist. That bill was a medium thick bill. They can eat seeds, they can eat nuts, but they can eat insects. So they're a real generalist. And right at this moment, with, with some uncertain times for nature, generalists are doing quite well, whereas specialists at the moment, in many cases, are struggling. So second on our uh, list of pets here, um, this is a, a, a great tit. And great tits uh, uh, were number seven on the on the list of the great British great 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 garden garden bird watch. So interestingly, you can actually tell the sex of this great tit. This is something that everyone can do in their gardens really easily. Is that 
down the breast here, you can see the black solid line. And right down at the bottom, it meets across between both of the legs. And so this is a male great tit. The females have a dotted black and admixed line down the front. So you can actually tell the sex of your great tits. Just very interestingly, actually, you'll notice this great tit has got a ring on. And we caught this one, believe it or not, last week in Savanac Forest. But this ring is more interesting, the plastic one, because this plastic ring was fitted by researchers in Whiteham Woods. Whiteham Woods is where Oxford University do their studies, um, all, all sorts of in-depth studies on, on great tits in particular. And so this bird was ringed as a nestling on the 23rd of May near Oxford. And then we retrapped it last week in Savannah Forest. So that is, that's not migration, that is dispersal. That's a young bird, just keep looking, keep looking, keep looking. And it's made it as far as Sabnak, which for a supposedly sedentary bird is, is very, very far. So just, just quite interesting. And next on our list here, this is a very, very common garden bird. And this is the chaffinch. So chaffinch has many times been considered the most common bird in the whole of the UK. But it's actually, according to the last survey, was fifth, fifth most common bird in the UK. And there are over five million pairs of chaffinches. Their population is very stable. They, they have the, the bill is fairly thick, but they can also eat insects. So they're a real generalist. And you'll have the, all the chaffinches that are local to your village. And then in the winter, there, there'll be more chaffinches will come into the country and they'll mix amongst your own chaffinches and you can't tell the two apart. Um, we can as ringers because the ones that migrate, funnily enough, have longer wings. So they have longer wings to help them migrate. So we can measure that, that as a person in your garden, you wouldn't, not, you wouldn't be able to tell. But interestingly, um, I had one that was, uh, I, I ringed it near Swindon uh, last November and it was retrapped by another bird ringer in halfway up Finland, and it was caught in his garden. So that just shows you that that bird is, 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 a, is an Arctic breeding chaffinch. That's what that bird has done, and it's come down to Wiltshire for last winter. So very, very interesting. And then we have the greenfinch. Now, greenfinch is handsome, handsome bird. When I started bird watching in the mid 90s, green finches were very, very common, very common. And the, to tell the age and the sex of green finches is very, very complex. But the major thing that you can look for in your garden is this solid bar of gold in the wing. The solid bar of gold, that will be a male. If that is gold admixed with bits of black, then that will be most likely be a female. But this, this one was caught near Castle Eaton two weeks ago. But greenfinches have suffered a catastrophic decline. So the same metrics of, of looking at breeding bird surveys and bird censuses, things like this, that the British Trust for Ornithology produce, you can see that the population rose from 1994 till about 2004. And then ever since then, there has been a steady and quite catastrophic decline. Now, this is a very, very serious decline, and they have started to show signs of stabilising. What caused this decline? Many birds we don't know, but with greenfinch we do. It's one thing. It's called trichomoniasis. And tri trichomoniasis is a disease that affects the back of the throat, and it, it, it makes the, the bird struggle to swallow and, and stuff like this. And you can find greenfinches and some other species underneath bird feed is looking extremely lifeless or just listless, really, really weak. And um, that is trichomonosis. And the best thing I can tell people to solve that problem is to keep washing bird feeders. Keep washing bird feeders regularly. So this is a mistake that many people make. They, they feed the birds. Bird after bird is landing on the same perches, the same posts. Also think about how they're they're landing on a perch to come to the feeders. And then they, 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 will, they will defecate on there. They'll, they'll have infected feet that get on there, all of these things. So the best defense that anyone can do is to continually wash your bird feeders. I actually know some people who do lots and lots of high intensity bird feeding and they've actually got a cycle of bird feeders. So they might have 15 bird feeders, 
but four are always in the washing up bowl at any one point and they're just continually going around cleaning them so so please 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 if you go away from this talk and you feel really inspired to go and feed garden birds and things like this keep washing the feeders washing the tables keep it clean okay and then we have this very very familiar bird um they they excite me quite a bit because i grew up with lots of them around and there's not so many around as there once were um, so this is a house sparrow. This is a male house sparrow. And they were, which I'm delighted to say, they were number one on the Great British uh, Garden Bird Watch last year. And that's heartening news because they had suffered a decline. Um, but since then, they've, they've smoothed out. So the male house sparrow has got these lovely chestnut wings with, with black ad mixed in. They've got a black bib. And then you've got a grey frontal shield, a grey sort of forehead. Now, interestingly, there has been studies done that show the, the size of the black bib is related to your dominance and your position within the colony. So it, it's assumed that the larger the black bib, the more dominant a bird you are. So that must play a part in display and, and, and things like that. But people then ask me, what does a female house sparrow look like? And I find a female house sparrow very, very hard to describe because they're kind of quite plain. Um, and, and so very hard to kind of describe to anyone what in particular that looks like. And incidentally, in the summer, all the juveniles look like that as well. And they only take on the male plumage, if you're, if you're a male, in around about October. So, so female house sparrows can often be a, a, a confusion species uh, for people. So with House Sparrow, these charts are interesting, and I'll try to bomb you with too many charts, but they're, they're fascinating. And if you see on the left here, the House Sparrow decline through the 1970s, the 1980s, and the 1990s was absolutely devastating, an incredibly sharp decline. And the interesting thing was, was that when they are now looking into why House Sparrows have declined, we're largely unable to say why. And one of the factors is that in the 1960s and 70s, house sparrows were so common, there was actually a government ban on ringing them because it was thought that the, they were so common, the data would be of no use. Now, they really, really wish they had that data because now they've declined. We don't know what many of those reasons were. Um, but since 1994, if you look on the, the chart on the right here, they've, they've really stabilised. The population that is remaining is, is really stable. Now, there's many reasons for this decline. Some say that it's uh, toxins in, um, in, in unleaded fuel. Uh, some say, and I, I believe this is more likely, that the changes in how we manage our gardens is, is, to, is to blame for this decline. So, for instance, not as many people now growing vegetables as they once did, having allotments, having um, proper flower gardens, um, and, and even some people now having grotesque plastic lawns, things like this, you know. So, so in those days, there were lots of moths, there were lots of butterflies that would be feeding on your fruit and vegetables. And that's what tree, uh, house sparrows feed their young on in the summer. And of course, if you miss anything, if, if things are seeding, then of course they'll eat the seeds as well during the winter. So, so for that reason really, is that that was probably the major factors of the decline. Um, and that to some extent, we're not ever gonna know totally what happened, but they are stable now and that's, that's great news. So love them or hate them, a starling is quite beautiful quite quite beautiful and they they were number three on the garden bird watch now that might sound very heartening might be fantastic number three great and they've gone through a 50 percent decline since 1994 half the uk population since 1994 i think that is absolutely frightening but the metrics that work out the starling population uh decrease or increase if it ever did that are based on breeding birds and so the issue is that 
the, the birds we're seeing in the winter are heavily augmented by birds coming in from the continent. So when you see the news and you see these huge starling murmurations flying around over places like West Hay, they look exceptional, they look amazing. Most of those birds are actually migrants, they're, they're immigrants from Europe. And we, we know this from bird ringing because many of the birds that are caught by ringers in the winter come from places like Lithuania, Latvia, stuff like this. There, there's many, many uh, records of birds from Northern Europe being recalled or found in England. So even though it's great, we've got lots of numbers and they're prevalent in gardens right now, as a breeding bird, they're still suffering. And we're not entirely sure why still. Some say there's the, it, it's a change because of the loss of the elm tree, because elm trees have lots and lots of holes in and starlings could nest in elm tree holes. Some say it's to do with some of the pesticides that we use and that we're not using some of them now and that they're improving. Either which way, they're, they're actually quite a sad loss to, to our countryside. I'll just give you a couple of very, very slight tips on starlings, because in the, in the summer, the, the, you can sex them, the, the females have a pink base to the bill and the males have a blue base to the bill, just to be stereotyped. But actually, what you can say in the winter is, I know this bird is a male. And the reason is in the winter, the eye is all dark, completely dark, apart from the pupil being black. In a female, just inside the edge of the eye, there would be a, a very fine orange beige line. In, inside the eye and that's what the females look like so you can tell the males from the females if you're very close and then actually believe it or not these beautiful arrow shaped markings there's a chart that I have as a bird ringer where I can look up these shapes of these and I can then tell the age of them to see whether it's one year old or whether it's two years old so this is a full adult male these these arrow shapes are very very thin the, the, the thinner they are, the more either male or, or the older. So this, because it's all black eye and these very fine arrow marks, this is a adult male starling. And you, you would never have known that before. <laughs> so this bird here is, is probably, I would say, the most, the most underrated um, bird that we have in our towns and in fact I also call them the forgotten garden bird. So this is a dunnock and the, the dunnock is the right name but many people will know them as a hedge sparrow and you, you can call it a hedge sparrow but if you remember at the start I said look at the bill, is that a sparrow's bill? And the answer is no, it's an ascentor's bill. So an ascentor is, is what a, a, a dunnock is, is it is, it's spelled A-C-C-E-N-T-O-R. So it's, it is an insectivorous bird, but it's a real omnivore. So they, they can eat seeds. This one is at a feeding station, there's a peanut down there, but they can eat seeds and they eat insects in the summer. So these were a real generalist and in high quality farmland with good hedgerows, there are a lot of dunnocks. And in fact, if you listen to a dunnock song, they're, they're a lovely jumble of words. And um, I've actually caught, these when I was ringing in in Norway and, and I always think Dunnock sounds like quite an ugly name and and I very much I always tell people this I love the Norwegian name for Dunnock because the Norwegian name for Dunnock is Jarnsperv and I think it sounds much nicer and in fact what Jarnsperv means it means iron sparrow and when you see the grey in the front of a Dunnock for me that is iron it, it's 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 a real Real solid looking, very pretty bird actually close up. So, so, so for me, they're always a yarn spurve. Now, Dunnocks, this is a, a map of Wiltshire on the left here. So this is a map that shows the abundance of, of, um, of Dunnocks in the county. And you can see that they really are ubiquitous. They really get everywhere in, in the county here. And the places where there's the fewest are the Salisbury Plain and the middle of the Marlborough Downs, where you, you've got this wonderful chalk grassland, but it's not ideal for dunnocks. So actually, you can just, it, it, it may surprise some people just how common dunnocks really are. 
But on the right hand side, you can see the decline they suffered through the 1970s and the 1980s. Another catastrophic decline. And um, I was a child of the 70s. Um, but just thinking back to those years, it makes us wonder what the heck were we doing as a country in, in the 70s? What were we doing to our countryside? Um, I, I wasn't old enough to have known too much at the time, but a, a lot of it is assumed to be hedgerows, uh, sort of people, you know, farmers ripping out hedgerows, cutting hedgerows too narrowly, too, too thin, things like this. And Dunnocks make a, a nest and they, they, they'll nest very tight into a dense hedgerow. So every time when you're driving outside of where you live, if you drive outside, you see a hedgerow looking like that with a very, very flat top. That hedgerow has been destructive. You can see through it, it's rubbish. What the farmer should do is cut it like that and like that so that it's got a wide base and the birds can make a nest in there and then predators can't see in. And so they suffer from, from loss of hedgerows. And that's why they're not on a salty plain in the Marlborough Downs. So just, just a different way of looking at that, that lovely bird. So this, this bird here, when I was, when I was first looking into birds when I was a, a quite a young child, I, I read a description that if you could see a wren, people often would mistake it for a leaf blowing across the road. And my mum still ribs me to the fact how many leaves I saw that I said were wrens when I was a child. Um, but uh, lovely, lovely bird, incredible songster. But rather surprisingly, they were not in the top 10 of the Garden Bird Watch. And that's because I think a lot of people are watching bird feeders and they're missing them underneath the bird feeders and they're flying around. But believe it or not, the wren is the UK's most common bird. They, because they can breed everywhere. If you're in the Highlands of Scotland, on a, on a heather moor in Yorkshire, there's a wren somewhere. They, they, will, they, will, they, they can eke out a living, living on, and if you notice the bill, very, very tiny, slender, winkle picker bill. They eat spiders. They eat tiny little bunny spiders and things like this. So when you see them go around your flower pots, they're taking spiders and tiny, tiny little things. So, they, but they can eke out a living anywhere. There is even a separate race of wren on Shetland, and there is a separate race of wren on St Kilda. And St Kilda, if you think about it, is off the top of Scotland, go west off the west coast of Ireland and go north, that's where St Kilda is. And that has got its own population of wren, St Kilda wren, and they live in these old stone, um, almost prehistoric looking houses. Quite, quite incredible. So not in the top 10 of the garden, but Britain's most common bird, eight and a half million pairs of wrens in the UK. And so there is your quiz question, folks. Okay, so the robin, very, very familiar bird to us. Um, I think it's now classed as Britain's national bird, which is which is wonderful. Uh, robin redbreast, apart from the fact it's orange. And the, the reason for that is that until the orange was introduced to the UK, we didn't actually have a word for orange. We only had red. So that's why they're called redbreast and not robin orange breast. So with a, with a robin, they were sixth on the list on the, on the garden bird watch. We all know if you dig your garden, they'll come and look for the worms and be very confiding. But they're second, they're the second most common bird in the UK, over about seven and a half million pairs across the UK. So they're a real generalist. They can survive lots of, lots of habitats, things like that. But interestingly, in the winter, we hear robins singing and we see them fighting and they're very, very aggressive and they will fight to the death. And that is because there are, there are a lot, a lot of foreign robins that come to the UK for the winter. So if, if you think, for instance, in Norway, about 90% of Norway's birds migrate out of Norway in the winter and they have to go somewhere. So we get their robins. And I've been on the East Yorkshire coast and I've seen robins, I've, I've seen working down through one section of, of the Yorkshire coast, a place called Spurn Point. In a day, I saw a thousand robins just pouring through, just pouring through. And we know this because a couple of years ago, two, in 2018, I was ringing birds on a farm at Berwick Bassett and caught some robins. I didn't think too much of it amongst the tree sparrows that I study. 
but one of those robins was recovered by another bird ringer in Lithuania in April. Now, ag again, we just want evidence like this to tell us that that, that place is, is a spit between Lithuania, I think, and Latvia, and or something like this. And, and so basically, it's a big migrant place. So that bird wasn't stopping there. It was going on. So we don't know where to, but that bird will have been going on potentially even as far as Russia. So it just goes to show you when you see that robin in your garden, or you see two robins fighting, it's more likely that you've got your resident robin is trying to see the continental invader off. That's more than likely what is happening. And speaking of such things, we have the lovely blackbird. Few birds are more beautiful really than an adult male blackbird and we can tell this is an adult male blackbird because one thing it's got this beautiful banana of a bill but also in the wing here if you see the wing is all largely one color sort of blackish if this section here and this section here was brown that would be a young bird but this is an adult male an adult male blackbird now Blackbird came in at number four in the Great British Garden Bird Watch, which is fantastic. But actually, just like the robin, and not all of our blackbirds in the winter are resident. So again, there are these, these birds coming in from Scandinavia. So this is also an adult male black, uh, blackbird. But if you look at it here, Two things, well, it's got a, a dark bill, and it's also got this kind of scaling, you see on, on the breast feathers. And this is very much a continental pattern of what a blackbird looks like. So you can actually tell continental blackbirds from resident. I'll just go back and show you the resident blackbird, very black, shiny, the bright yellow eye ring, the big bright yellow bill, and then you've got the continental one. And um, I've, I've had a blackbird that I ringed in, um, in Wiltshire. Um, unfortunately, it was found dead in Norway, but it was found dead in Norway the following spring. It hit a window. Um, but again, further evidence that that's what these birds are doing. And then this is a bird that uh, has suffered a, a, another big decline, 50% decline in, in the UK over the last 30 years. This is a song thrush, and you don't see them now like you used to, smashing snails on a rock in my mum's garden, things like this. That's how I used to recall seeing these. Um, and, and they're a sad loss because they're a beautiful singer. They are a bit of a mimic, so they'll mimic other birds around them that they, if, if there's something else singing there, they might think, well, I'll throw that into my song and have a bit of that. The one tip I can tell you, if there's a song thrush singing in your village, how to pick up a song thrush. I've, I've led uh, bird watch walks and people say, what's that? And I say, a song thrush. And they say, what's that? I said, that's a song thrush. What's that? That's a song thrush. And the reason is song thrush is repeat. So it doesn't matter what note they do, but it will always be repeated three, nearly always four times. So if it's a to do, they're going to go to do, to do, to do, to do. If they want to go chirp, it's going to be chirp, 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 chirp. And whatever they do, it be four. Just count to four, song thrush. Count to four, song thrush. That's kind of what they do. Okay. So, but with a song thrush, just they're a bit smaller than a blackbird. Okay. And their breast is is fairly what? pale, but they've got oh. these black speckles down the front. And don't confuse these with the missile thrush that we're going to see a bit later, like here. So this is a missile thrush, and people often get these mistaken for a song thrush, but missile thrushes are big. They're, they're, they're bigger than a blackbird, and they are singing right now. They are singing this lovely fluting song from the tops of trees right now. And it, one of the things that I can pick a, so, a, a song thrush from missile thrush, in missile thrush, the back here is much greyer. They're bigger than a blackbird. And when they fly on the underarm of the song thrush, it's orange. And on underarm of the missile thrush is white. So you can always tell that as they fly. A missile thrush flies like this. It's got this lovely undulating flight. So that's what you see. I, I saw one today in a village um, in, in Berkshire that I was driving through. I just saw the back of it on, just undulating, and I knew it was a missile thrush. 
So um, lovely, lovely bird. And, and they're called a storm cock up north because they, they will sing in storms. They will sing to everything. Beautiful, beautiful songster. And then we've got these right now. If you've got berry bushes, if you've got uh, apple trees, these, these invaders from, from Scandinavia will come in. This is a field fair. Lovely bird. You can even pick up field fairs in flight. You don't have to be an expert on, on bird identification. In the morning, if you're stood outside, you, you're in a fairly rural area where you folks are, out in the fields, these things will go over in a big flock and they go chat 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 like that. And if you hear chat 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 chat, that is field fairs flying over. And um, their name suggests that they were once eaten and they were caught from the fields, fair of the field, food of the field. So they, they, they do eat uh, worms, but they love berry bushes and they will fight a missile thrush for the berry bushes. And then the last and the most beautiful of the thrushes is the red wing. So, so named because it's got the red underwing, um, but they've always got this, this really, really good supercilium, the eye stripe. So that is something very noticeable. And the great thing with red wing is they, they, their migration has stopped now. But in October, if you, October, November, stand outside of your house in the dark and just, you'll just hear a high pitched pss, like this pss, pss, going over, pss, just a seep, high seep. And that's red wings and they're actively migrating right through the night. So there's, there's quite a lot of bird watchers that just will go out in November and they'll just stand outside for a few minutes just to hear migration actually happening. And I think that's magical. I love migration. Migration's superb. And, and these birds are, are doing that. But a lot of our red wings, they will carry on. And they, we know this from ringing. They carry on and they will go right down to Santander and, and places like that in Spain and Portugal. That's where they, their final destination is before then heading back to Scandinavia. So if you've got lots of birds in the garden, you hopefully will see some of these. And people are fans of sparrowhawks, some people are not. I love a sparrowhawk. And if, if a sparrowhawk is hitting your house sparrows and your house sparrows are declining, all it's going to do is take the weak ones out, the slow ones, the fat ones, the lazy ones and the old ones. And it's survived to the fittest. Once it can't take any more, it will stop hunting your garden. And, and then only the strongest and the fastest and the cleverest and the wariest survive. So all they're doing is, is picking off the weak. Now, interestingly, and I've got a, just a, another little thing to amaze your friends with, this sparrowhawk is a young one. And we know it's a young one because all of these fringes, all the feathers are all ginger, all ginger edges. These are all juvenile feathers. All these ginger bits are all juvenile. And it will molt many of those, but it will keep those for at least another year, some of those. So if there's any ginger bits in the wing, it's a young one. But the other thing I love about them is when a sparrowhawk is young, it's got these lovely hearts on the breast. Beautiful hearts there, lovely they are. When it's an adult, when they molt those through next year, there goes a very fine line. And the older they get, the narrower the line becomes. So this is a young, young one, whereas this one, is a stunning, stunning adult male sparrowhawk. The few bars we can see in this photograph are very, very fine, very, very fine bars. And you see there's no ginger edges anywhere, and it's bluish. So this is an adult male sparrowhawk. And this one was hunting red wings just above five field about two years ago. Um, you don't get much better than that if you're a sparrowhawk. So uh, yeah, there we go. But sparrowhawks, everyone, when I talk to some farmers, they'll say, oh, of course, there's too many sparrowhawks. And I think, well, there's not. Um, and if you see here, sparrowhawks haven't actually increased. What they've actually done is they're fairly stable, but there has been a slight decline over the last sort of 10 years. There's been just a, just a, just a slight decline in them. And, and so they're only taking advantage of what, of what birds there are. And if there's not enough prey items, then they won't exist. So it's just part of nature's balance. Now, if, if we were in, in person, I would ask you what this bird was. I would ask people because not a lot of people know what this bird is. Watching certain programs on TV, you might know. So this is a cuckoo and they really are a big bird. So the cuckoos at the moment, they're all gonna be down somewhere in Central Africa, probably in a rainforest or in a savanna, eating big hairy caterpillars. Um, 
cuckoos are very hard to catch, actually, from a bird ringing perspective. The best way we catch them is actually by ringing the youngsters when they're in a nest uh, in with reed warblers. But the reason I put this in, not this a garden bird, but it's such, such an enigmatic bird and such a part of our our lives you you hear a cuckoo and a cuckoo has a big territory and 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 we, we've all heard them not happy a bird watcher to know cuckoo um but they've suffered an incredible decline i mean it is so alarming and there are several factors as to why this is it might be a decline in some of the host species so things like meadow pipits and tree pipits out on dartmoor they've declined but actually the BTO, the British Trust for Ornithology, they have been putting satellite trackers on the cuckoos. And you can look this up on the internet and you'll see the routes they're taking. And it shows that there's two populations. One goes down through Gibraltar and one goes through Italy. But it's showing that mortality is the highest when they're returning north. And what happens in Africa is Africa dries out in the winter. This time of year, we're in the dry season. Caterpillars become harder to come by. Birds lose weight. And then they're going to migrate when they're not in brilliant condition. And with the Sahara becoming wider, it's a harder crossing to cross the Sahara. With the weather systems in the Mediterranean becoming more volatile, that's also a dangerous crossing now. And so these are the challenges facing a thing like a cuckoo to come back. And, and so we were always wondering what's wrong with the UK. And of course, we've got enough that's wrong, but it's also what's happening worldwide. And climate change is a factor. The wine in the Sahara and these, these devastating squalls in the Mediterranean. So just be aware, it, it, it's, it's not us, it's, it's us and them and everywhere. So this could sound a bit negative. We've got this declining, we've got that declining. It's all a bit depressing. And then you get this bird, which happens to be not my favourite. And the reason that my favourite is it destructs my nest boxes because the great spotted woodpecker is a complete success. It is a, this, this bird is going through the roof. People report them on their gardens and I'll forget to see the woodpecker. I'm thinking, yeah, I know there's loads. There's loads. There's loads of woodpeckers. Yeah, yeah. In the last 30 years, there's been a 300% increase in great spotted woodpeckers. So we've got all these declines, it's a bit negative, but these are the adapters. So what they've done, they have profited from the lack of competition from starlings. So starlings used to compete with these for nest sites. These have now got, got starlings out of the way. They're doing well. They're adapting to bird feeders and they're also adapting to, to uh, take a nest of other birds. And so they will take house, house martin nests. They'll rip house martin nests apart and they'll take the house martin chicks, house sparrows, they'll take those. Uh, blue tick nest boxes, if you don't put a metal guard on the front of your nest box and they work out, they will drum it out in two days and they'll take all the eggs of the chicks. So uh, they're incredibly adaptive and it's great because people get to see quite a tropical looking bird in their garden, that 300% increase. So it's not all doom and gloom. So this shows 10 years apart. Wiltshire on the left, Wiltshire on the right. And that was the frequency at which people were seeing great spotted woodpeckers. That shows what that bird has done. And again, you'll see the salted plain in the Marlborough Downs. You haven't got many trees. We've got this specialist chalk grassland. That's the only reason they're not in those central areas. So that is a, a heartening sign, okay? And, and another positive bird, this is the black cap. We're really, really good in the UK at naming birds for what they've got. That's a black cap. Well done. We're really, really good at this. Apart from when you see the female, and she's a brown cap. So black caps are increasing hand over fist. They are, they're, 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 they're increasing all the time. And we also now, as well as the ones that breed in the summer, and those ones that breed in the summer are now in Africa. We've got these ones that come into your gardens in the winter. And in, in the 1960s, a, a black cap in the garden was something really special. Now it's just something that's nice. And the reason is these are birds from the continent. And when a bird from Northern Europe migrates, it migrates down around the Dutch coast. A lot of them will just on, on an east wind will drift across the, 
uh, the, the channel, work their way through Britain and keep heading south, southwest, until they get to Gibraltar, cross over through Africa, around to kind of West Africa, uh, Ghana, Liberia, Sierra Leone, Togo, Nigeria, those, those places. Um, but if you're coming from Scandinavia and you get down to us, to, to the UK in November, and it's still 15 degrees, and there's still apples on the tree, why well, keep going further? And that's what a lot of these birds have done. They are now coming back and they're just shortened their migration, which is a risk, and they're feeding on food given to them. And if you want to get black caps in your garden, the best way to do it is to put out things that are sweet. So there's one chap that he, he gets mince pies and breaks them up and put mince pies out. Fairy cakes crumbled out is brilliant. Apple cut in half, speared onto a, on, onto a tree. Very, very good. Speared upwards so that you've got the, the flesh upwards. They've got a sweet tooth for some reason. But yeah, crumbled fairy cake, cakes is, is the number one attractor for, for black caps. And this is the trend. So you've seen enough of these charts going down. So let's see a chart going up. And as you can see, the black cap is a real success. And that bill, if I just take you back to it, the bill is, is, is a medium bill. So they take insects, they will eat berries. So that's why the generalists are doing really well. And talk of a bird that's doing very well, goldfinch. So when I was a, a kid, quite hard to see goldfinches. You wouldn't see very many. Most people know they've got that lovely name for a flock of goldfinches. It's, it's called a charm. And everything about goldfinches is charming and beautiful and delicate and lovely. And, and they're, they're great. They have adapted to garden bird feeding. So they used to feed just on Niger feeder. On, and so, so Niger seed was, uh, is, a, is a type of a thistle. Um, but actually, in recent years, they love sunflower hearts. And they've just really adapted to garden bird feeding. And so in the last 20 years, they've had... Um, well, last 30 years, they've had a 170% increase. So it's, it's just nice to see not only a bird doing well, but a beautiful bird doing well. And so that's the, the chart for goldfinch. You can see in the 70s and 80s, they were a bit up and down, and I don't know why. But since the onset of garden bird feeding in the mid 80s, they've just had this exponential rise. And I, I, I see no reason to expect that that rise won't continue I, I think that they have just adapted and and that's what that, that's what happens sometimes you get adaptations and some birds react better and, and some birds don't so this beautiful little bird is a long-tailed tip so I'm now going to take you through some birds that you may not see in your garden a lot but people love them when they get them as a visitor and so just to sort of say that you'll get You'll get birds that you'll, you'll kind of um, just see infrequently, maybe. So long-tailed tits, if there's a flock of long-tailed tits in your village, they'll have a circuit. They'll have a circuit whereby they work around the whole village in a day. They'll, they'll just keep checking different bits and, and, and places of where they can feed. They're cooperative breeders. So you have a dominant male and a female, you can't tell them apart in the field. And then the youngsters from last year will help them. And um, they'll, they'll work through. And what they're doing now though, they're, re they're adapting really, really well to suet feeders and fat balls. So, so people are putting fat balls out in their gardens, in their nets and things. And these, these really, really take very well to fat balls. So that's a great way to, to attract long-tailed tits. And this is a bit of a favourite of mine. You'll get these if you've got any conifers near you. And sometimes you only need to have two conifer trees and suddenly you'll get one of these. The, the telltale giveaway, people often mistake this bird for a great tip. Apart from the fact it's half the size of a great tip and it's a bit more ashy. You could say a bit more coaly. This is a coal tip. And the distinctive thing with a coal tit is got a white stripe at the back of the head. And if it's on a different angle, the white comes right down. But so, so yeah, so, so if you've got any conifers around you, you could well get a coal tit. Coal tits in the UK are very, very sedentary, but there is an immigration of continental coal tits. Not very many, but if you do get one, and I've not personally seen one in Wiltshire, I've seen them on Portland Bill migrating, 
if you do get one, what it, the indication will be, this bit will be much, much bluer. But believe me, that's hard to tell. You'll do well to record that. But if you see a cold tit in your garden, I get one in my garden every three years or so. Very, very nice. I like a cold tit. They're lovely. And then we have Britain's smallest bird. So this is a gold crest. And, and a gold crest, <laughs> the first thing I have to say, you may think it looks a bit sad. And they do. They've always got this face. It looks like someone's just stolen their sweets. And I, I don't know why, but I think it's probably because of this of this little dark line that comes down. So a gold crest, just to give you some facts on these, they, they're the bird equivalent of a shrew. They don't really live much above one year. The British record is just under four. Um, but they have large broods and they, they, um, at their, their normal weight is about five grams. The heaviest one I've ever caught is six grams. And at 4.1 grams, they're dead. At 4.4, they're struggling. So they live on an absolute knife edge. They're on the edge of life all the time. The amazing thing with these, when they're roosting, how does that bird roost at night? Do you know what it does? It sits out on a branch, an open branch, and with its feathers, it does this. It fluffs all the feathers out to become a complete and utter ball to hold the temperature in. Absolutely remarkable little things. These things as well, the population in the UK is heavily augmented by migrants, for, again, from Scandinavia. So I've been on the Yorkshire coast and seen these wave popping, coming in just off the waves. And it is, it is thought that they might actually be using that little bit of hydrofoil off the top of the waves just to keep them up. How many, how many pitch into the sea must be frightening. But um, they, they come in in big, big numbers from Scandinavia. So personally, I've actually caught... I've, I've caught two now that I know are from Scandinavia. I've had one from Norway with a Norwegian ring on and one from Sweden. So we've got evidence to say that that's what they do. So, um, and, and you'll hear these. And, and ladies, you've got a much greater chance than the men because their call is the highest pitch. Seep, 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 seep. Very, very high pitched. And it's often beyond many of us men. So um, you, you have a slight advantage there. And again, they love conifer trees. And that, and that bill shows about they eat, they eat insects. This great big looking beast, this is a brambling, a stunning, stunning finch. So this is the real northern equivalent of a chaffinch. And if brambling's around in Wiltshire right now. So a brambling, they are related, very, very closely related to a chaffinch. They're a bit bigger than a chaffinch. The big distinction is they have a white rump. So when they fly out away from you, a chaffinch has a green rump. So it all looks dark as a flock of chaffinches go away. Bramblings have a white rump. And they will visit garden feeders, particularly as it gets a bit harsher. Uh, but bramblings at the moment, what they love to go, they love to feed on beech mast. So if you've got a beech wood nearby, you could walk through and you might just see bramblings at the moment. But they are coming on garden feeders. Um, and where the chaffinch makes a noise like pink, 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 as they call, bramblings go wee, wee. And that's a telltale, talk, uh, telltale sound for me in a forest. I can pick up bramblings just on call. But they've got this white rump as they go away. So at the moment, walking through Savannah Forest, I cannot go into Savannah Forest without seeing bramblings. So that's something to look for, because they can turn up any garden. And then this little bird is related to to the goldfinch and these very much like goldfinches these like to feed on niger feeders and they also feed on sunflower hearts so this little bird is a siskin and that is my hand there so you can see that it's it's only small same size as a goldfinch but yeah this is a siskin they're very very common breeders in wales and uh and and scotland um and the, the dales but they only breed in Wiltshire, really, in pine forests. So the best place, believe it or not, for siskins breeding in Wiltshire is centre parks. Centre parks and Longleat, where you've got lots and lots of conifer trees. So there's lots of pairs that breed there. So if you're feeding sunflower hearts and you get gold finches, you might just get a stunning siskin. And this is a male because he's got an all black head. If you see them and then they're much more streaky, and they don't have the black on top of the head, 
than that's a female. And right at the moment, we've got a big, big movement of jays is happening into the country. Big, big movement of them. And uh, these are incredible birds. So that they are birds that come from the continent. And there, there's probably been a failure of the acorn crop in a large area of northern Europe. And so we've got jays coming in um, en masse. There, there's some really people are seeing three and four together. For quite a shy bird, um, that's, that's pretty impressive. And they, they have been visiting gardens. So do look out for a jay. If you see a bird a bit bigger than a jackdaw and it's coloured and it's got, again, a white rump, it will have been a jay. They don't like people, so it, it won't be that confiding. And then one of the most beautiful birds in the, in the UK, the, the bullfinch, um, these, these, are, they, these eat buds. So in Kent, they were uh, regarded as a pest species because they were eating the buds of the orchards in, in Kent. Um, and in fact, believe it or not, very strange fact, that is why in the 19th or 18th century, the little owls were introduced. They were introduced to the UK to try and control bullfinches. A rather bizarre fact, but it's the truth. But bullfinches, they, they will eat docks. They will eat, um, they'll eat anything soft. So, but they nest, they're very tiny nests. And they nest in dense hedgerows. So they, they go up and down a bit population wise, as you can see here. So their trend through the 70s and the 80s, they were obviously a bad time for birds. They really declined. But actually in recent years, they've just been increasing. So and the amazing thing with bullfinches is once they've worked out how to feed, the adults actually show the young ones how to feed. So they actually will teach them and you'll have three young ones with a parent. The male will be looking out and the female showing them how to feed on what they're going to be feeding on. It's, it's brilliant when you see it happening. And the, the population of buzzards. So how many times people have asked me, Matt, I've seen this bird. It's about the size of a buzzard, but it's too dark. Or I've seen a bird. It's about the size of a buzzard, but it's too pale. And the answer is buzzard on everything. They have all these colour morphs that they have. Just every different one. This one's a slightly dark one. Um, buzzards have been one of the amazing successes. So in the 90s, when I used to go bird watching in Cornwall, when coming back up, well, going to Cornwall, normally we would see the first buzzard by about Somerset. That, that would be how it was like in, the in 1995. I, I, I drive from Swindon and by about Glastonbury, I'd see my first buzzard. Nowadays, they're just everywhere, which I think is wonderful. The lovely mewing call that we hear. So with, with buzzard, since the bad old days of the 70s and the 80s, they've had a steady and rather meteoric rise. The only thing now that is checking their rise is something else. So since 1967, Buzzards have had an 800% increase in the UK. It's, it's quite staggering. And if you see lots and lots of buzzards sat out in the fields near where you live, they're eating worms. That's what they're doing. It's not very glamorous. It's not very bird of prey -y, but that's what they're doing. They're eating worms. This is why the buzzards' population increase is being checked. It's competition from red kites. In the 1820s, the red kite was the most uh, populous bird, uh, bird of prey in the UK. And they were great. They were great scavengers. They were tidying up after people. They were eating dead people. They were doing all, all this stuff to tidy up all of our waste. And gamekeepers were persecuting them back in the day as well. But they really became persecuted because they got so confident they were actually taking food out of people's hands and they were taking pies off of stalls, things like this. So it's interesting how they're getting more bold and coming to people's gardens now because they might be repeating what they once did 200 years ago. So very, very interesting. Red kites became extinct in England. Um, there were only a few pairs left in Wales and they've been a, the result of an incredible um, uh, reintroduction um, with birds using birds from Sweden and they've now colonized most of the UK there's still a lot of studies going on with them because 
um, they, they move quite interestingly. Some stay put and some move. There's a lot of very interesting movements with them, uh, population dynamics. But since 1991, when they were introduced, they've had, a, again, an 800% increase. So all these birds going down, these are doing really well. These are, in the main, scavengers. Um, and I've ringed a lot of red kites as nestlings, and we climb up and we go into the nest and we ring the chicks. And a lot of red kite nests have corvid remains, remains of magpies and crows in them, um, young, young jackdaws. So they're actually competing with the, with the corvids. So for, for many people, when I do talks to farmers, that, that gets uh, greeted very well. So, um, and, and they're just increasing, increasing, and they're gonna keep increasing. Um, so that shows you the population curve for red kite. I see no reason at all why that's not gonna just continue and continue. And just to say, thank you, that's it from me. If, uh, just a few contacts, if you're on Twitter, I can be found here uh, at Matt the Sparrow. Um, if you're not already a member and want to sort of join some, some uh, charities to do, that do good work for birds, on a national scale, we all know about the RSPB, very, very large charity, very powerful political charity. I am also a massive fan of the BTO, British Trust for Ornithology, it's a charity in its own right. It, it is not very, it's, it's not biased in any way. All it's doing is getting the data, all those charts that you saw, everyone is by BTO volunteers. That's about science, gathering data, using data to conservation benefit and inform the government. So I'm a massive fan. If you're not a member of the BTO, do consider joining. And if you're into birds locally, then, you can also join the Wiltshire Ornithological Society, only say that with your teeth in. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Well, thank you so much. I mean, wasn't that incredible, everybody? Um, yes. I, can't, I can't begin to say um, how much I've taken on. I mean, the one thing that I certainly struck me was the black cap. I had no idea that that was, you know, I'll, I'll be watching out for, for because <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen one. They've got the most um, beautiful melodic song, beautiful song. Okay, lovely. Now, are you okay to take a few questions? Absolutely, yeah. Um, can you see everybody on the screen? And are you able to do this yourself? Just by, I don't know if people can put their hands up um, or do the yellow button. Yeah. Can people unmute themselves if they want to speak? And... Um, mm -hmm. Simply put your hands up because I'm finding it a bit difficult. Yeah. Um, yes, I'd like to know something. Okay. Go yeah. ahead. A very uh, briefly, uh, Dunnox. Uh, I'm pleased to say I have uh, regular visits from Dunnox, um, and they're quite shy, and they um, usually feed under the bird feeder rather than on from it. Um, and we throw out very fine food because that's what seems to suit them. But I can't tell the, the difference between male and female. And nor can I, because you can't do it. Ah, right. <laughs> so, so their plumage is exactly the same. In the breeding season, as a ringer, we can, because we can blow on the front of the bird and the female has a brood patch all veined up to warm the eggs up. And the male, the cloacal protuberance, grows bigger to um, do the deed that they have to do. But the one thing with Dunnocks you have to be aware of as well is that they're very promiscuous. So one male will happily have up to sort of four, three to five females. Ah. They, they really are naughty boys. <laughs> Lovely. That's helpful. Thank you. Um, Steve. I, I don't know if you're able to see people better than I can. I don't know what it is, but I can't see well. Um, or if somebody wants to ask a question, just go ahead. <laughs> there was Glen Glenis has got her hand up. Oh, okay. Go ahead, what Glenis. would you recommend for cleaning bird feeders? Um, well, some people use disinfectant. To be honest, I just use uh, fairy liquid, you know, washing up liquid. Um, but I take them apart and give them a really, really thorough scrub down with 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 any kind of detergent soap. Really, is is fine. 
Brilliant. Thank you very much. Yeah. The only thing I do do is I make sure that every part of it is thoroughly dry before putting together so that if you put any food in afterwards, of course, it's not then going to spoil. Mm. Yeah, lovely. Thank you. Matt, that was a fantastic talk. I enjoyed it so much. And, and it was just your enthusiasm is so infectious, mate. So grateful. Um, I was wondering if you would ever use a Birdsong app yourself, whether there was anything you might recommend. Oh, that I'm the wrong person <laughs> to ask on that. The reason, oh, okay. the, the, the reason being, and and it's interesting. It's a very good question because I've been bird watching about five years. I remember talking to a few bird watchers, and they were saying, "It's right for you. You've been a bird watcher for years." And I said, "No, I haven't." And I, I'm just lucky that uh, my my particular brand of um, ADHD or something has, has got the focus that I, I know them. But one thing I would say to people is, is that what I did have is a determination in in sense of if, if I heard a bird singing and I couldn't find it, I, I would find it. I, I would wait till I saw it. And, and the thing is, we don't believe our ears, do we? We believe our eyes, not our ears. So there's a lot of bird watchers who, for instance, if they don't ever see a quail, but they hear a quail, they won't count it because they've got to see it. Well, I trust my ears. So I'm happy with that. So I, I don't know about the apps. I mean, there's a lot of very good apps now and they're, they're pretty good. One thing I would say to people is when you listen to those songs, though, maybe consider about a rhythm to the song or maybe also consider the pitch of the bird. So I always say to people when leading walks, sometimes you hear a bird, and you think, well, that like that thing I said about a song thrush is that they've got a pitch and they've got a repeat that, that kind of is them. So it doesn't matter if I hear my wife talking, it doesn't matter whether she's saying hello or goodbye. I still know it's her because of the pitch. And, and so, I, so I think people have to be a bit more imaginative when listening to birdsong. Don't get blinded by it. Just and maybe pick one bird and just sit there and watch it and, and just make sure you find it. Thank you. Okay. Patricia, I think you want to ask them. You need to unmute yourself, Patricia. No. <laughs> yes, it's at the bottom left hand corner of the screen. Oh, it's not right for me, thank you. Uh, um, thank you, Matt. Absolutely inspiring talk. I've been interested in birds all my life since I was a child. I really love birds. Um, interestingly, when I lived in northwest London, I had more but with old deciduous um, trees, particularly Bramley's. I had more birds than I do here in Limpley Stoke. Um, but the question I wanted to say was, I do have a phobia about rats, yes. so I don't feed the birds. I'd like to feed the birds, but for fear that I would encourage them, I don't. Any thoughts on that one? It's, it's very interesting, yeah. Um, when I've fed um, some places where I feed on farmland, yeah, we do get rats. I mean, I'm working with farmers over 200 square miles of land and we're feeding about 30 to 40 tonnes of seed per year. So that's a that's an incredible scale. One of the things that I've done to kind of reduce rats, if I if start having a small area, is, is I have a bird feeder and then I have the table underneath the bird feeder, but I have them both quite high. Um, but also you can get these squirrel guards these, these big domes. So, so for instance, if you've got like a pole going up, you yep. have a dome that arches down. And yep. if that's halfway up, you can then put your bird table on top of there. And if so, you could even put a feeder on top so that any of the food from the feeder collects on the table. And then that stops the rat going at the pole. Mm -hmm. yep. um, thank you, Matt. I'll probably have to ask Steve to help me with that one. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Yes, because I, mean, I was going to say squirrels are an equal problem. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Squirrels. Um, I'm not. A, I'm not a big fan of squirrels. No, me neither. Big grey ones. <laughs> yeah. Well, I love red squirrels, and I'd yes, happily yes. love red squirrels back. But grey squirrels, yeah. They um, on on most of the farms where I work, grey squirrels don't tend to do very well. Mm. <laughs> Good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, it, it's about ten past eight now I don't know if anybody else has another question or 
Steve, would you like to wind Denise, up? I think, I think we've got a couple, if that's okay. And th uh, Denise oh, okay. has got a hand up and, and Isabel as well. So maybe Denise first. Sorry. You need to unmute yourself. No, I was just going to say that we've solved our squirrel problem by putting grease, <laughs> the greasy pole. We've just put grease on the bird pole um, and we've watched the squirrels because they were eating all our bird food. Now they just, they've given up. Okay. They get halfway, get halfway up and they don't like it on their paws no. and they come down again. Fantastic. <laughs> okay, it saves buying one of those expensive yeah. doobries. Mm -hmm. That was all. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Isabel? Um, I just wanted to share um, with everyone a book that I've read on the Wren. It's called uh, The Wren Biography by Stephen Moss. And it looks at the Wren through the year, through the months. And what I find extraordinary about this teeny little bird is that it seems to have started life in North America many hundreds of years ago and crossed the Bering Straits into Asia and across Central Europe, down into Africa and up to us. And it's extraordinary how this little bird has um, managed to colonize the world. It's an absolutely fascinating read. Can't, can't recommend it highly enough. And in the and, and in the Americas, there's there's several species of wren. I mean, I, I don't know them all, but they've got house wren, Carolina wren, cactus wren, even. Oh, yeah. beautiful little things. Yeah. yeah. And in fact, I was in Mexico two years ago, just before the pandemic started. And right over in Mexico, they've got one called Yucatan wren. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> mm. Look, I, I think that's it, Anthea. I can't. Or is that Shamin? You were raising your hand. I just wanted to say that I really appreciate the quality of your photographs. It's so lovely to see those beautiful birds in such detail. Yes, here, here. Thank you. And, I mean, yeah. not all of them are mine. I mean, some of them are a local photographer, uh, a local photographer friend of mine uh, called Steve Burt, who, who's on various uh, media as well. There's a mixture of, of mine and his. So thank you.